Welcome everyone to our 2018 wet season YouTube live stream event. Uh, my name's Tim Penny. I'm an aviation safety advisor with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Welcome to everyone who's joining us this evening across the top end, all the way from Broome to Cairns and everywhere in between. We had a really successful seminar last night here in Darwin where we looked at wet season flying and all the hazards associated with flying across the top end of Australia at this time of year. For those of you out there that couldn't be there with us last night in Darwin, we're really pleased to have you with us this evening. I'm joined tonight by two special guests. On my right hand side is Harry Burns Fab. Harry's a forecaster with the Bureau of Meteorology here in Darwin. And we're also pleased to introduce Cameron Marchant to my left. Cameron is Head of Operations with Flight Standards here in Darwin. Both Harry and Cameron tonight will give us their own unique perspective on the hazards and the many challenges of wet, seeing, wet season flying. And tonight is also a great opportunity for you to send in your questions live to us here in the studio. It's an opportunity to unlock some of the knowledge and experience that these two guests bring to the table. So once again, thank you very much for joining us tonight and for being with us. So to kick things off tonight, let me just talk about why we're here. It's no secret that many young pilots, they move up from the southern states of Australia to the top end to commence their careers in aviation. As I said, most of these pilots learn to fly and go through flying schools down in the southern parts of our, of our country, and they arrive up in the top end, sometimes with as little as only 200 or 250 hours under their belt. Many of these pilots have little exposure to real life commercial operations. The top end is a big place, extending all the way from Broome in the west across to Cairns in the east. The top end of Australia has some very unique hazards to flying, not found anywhere else in Australia, especially, especially during the wet season. So tonight we're going to talk about some of the main hazards to flying across this top end, with a particular focus on the VFR pilot, and especially the novice commercial pilot in particular. It's important that we understand what these hazards are, how to manage those hazards, and also the good decision making that goes with them. Three things that are vital to keeping pilots safe up here in the top end. And we certainly hope that you can take away maybe a few gold nuggets to maybe put in, the, in place that extra layer of safety into your own wet season flying. So to kick things off this evening, I might start with you, Harry. Harry, as a forecaster here with the Bureau of Meteorology in Darwin, let's talk about the wet season. What do we mean by the wet season? When does it start? When does it finish? Those types of things. Yeah, so we define the wet season um, as starting in October and carrying right through to April. And in this time, the top end of Australia experiences on average around about 95% of its rainfall. And this is because uh, the, the southeasterly flow, which brings the drier weather, has broken down. There's not that strength to bring that warmer, drier air. So that allows the humidity to build up from, from our north and that brings them more moisture in the air and it also brings more instability. And that then brings about things like monsoons, thunderstorms, tropical cyclones, and then the associated hazards with them. Okay, so here we are uh, towards the end of October. So what part of the cycle are we in actually right now? Yeah, so as, as many people know um, who live in Darwin or around the top end, uh, this time of year it's starting to get a little more humid, a bit more sticky, and we're just starting to see our first thunderstorms around. And as we go further into November, those thunderstorms become a lot more regular. We might get one every second, third day. And then as we go later into the year, maybe once a day, we'll get those thunderstorms. And then as we go uh, further into December, that's when we start seeing uh, monsoonal conditions and maybe even uh, our first tropical cyclones of the year. OK, so the tropical cyclones that you mentioned, they usually, as you said, might kick off around the December 
time frame and, and how long can we expect to be at risk of cyclones? So we define the tropical cyclone season as uh, from the start of November right through to the end of April. Uh, so in this time, um, you could experience a tropical cyclone, but uh, around the top end, typically we won't, we won't see one until maybe late December. And the, the peak time is around that January, February time. Okay. Talking about thunderstorms, you said that they were a big part of the wet season. When do thunderstorms usually occur, Harry? Uh, uh, do they occur over land? Do they occur over the sea? Uh, do they occur, you know, night, day? How, how does it all work? So in the tropics, thunderstorms could occur anywhere, basically, at any time. But the most likely time for thunderstorms to occur over land is in the afternoon. And that's due to the surface heating, giving the energy... Um, the atmosphere needs to then to enable those parcels of moisture from the surface to lift up and then it's when you get starts you start to get that cumulus development sure. that de develops into the towering cumulus and then you get thunderstorms from that over maritime areas it's a little bit different it's actually reversed so that's most common in the evening through to the early morning period and that's due to the uh, what we call cloud top cooling so um, the sun isn't heating the atmosphere it allows the top of the clouds to cool right. and then this this temperature uh, profile allows the temperature which is warmer at the bottom of the atmosphere to then rise and and then that that's how thunderstorms can develop over maritime areas okay so across the across the top end of australia as i said all the way from from cairns to broome mm. what part of the of the top end of australia usually has the most thunderstorm days per year yeah, so the, the, as I said before, they're quite common right across the tropics of Australia. Around Darwin and the, the west coast of the top end typically sees around 80 thunder days on average per year, which is around about the highest for the tropics in Australia. Okay, that's good. Great information to know. We've spoken about thunderstorms and, and, and Harry's given us a, a bit of a discussion with regards to where they're operating and, and, and how they operate, but... Harry, what are some of the typical hazards that pilots need to be aware of when flying around or in the vicinity of these thunderstorms? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with the most obvious hazards. Obviously, um, when you get a thunderstorm, you get precipitation sure. and that gives you um, low visibility conditions. And then that can also develop low cloud uh, quite like around that precipitation. Um, within the thunderstorm and near, nearby the thunderstorm, we're getting very strong updrafts and Downdrafts, and these can be up to 6,000 feet per minute. Right. Uh, so this, from this, you get um, extremely, uh, you can get severe turbulence, uh, severe wind shear. Um, so, th so they're the kind of hazards within the storm itself. Um, and obviously, you also get lightning, which can be very hazardous to aircraft. Right. So there's something essentially that pilots w would do very well to try and avoid. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, when we talk about thunderstorms, one of the other things that we, we hear about is that word microburst. Uh, what exactly is, Harry, a microburst? And what are some of the telltale signs that they may be in the vicinity? And, and how should pilots manage them? So a microburst, uh, they, they typically happen uh, more often when there's a little bit more dry air in the atmosphere below the thunderstorm. And when the precipitation falls into this drier air, it evaporates. And then this evaporation causes cooling in the atmosphere, which then reduces the density around it. And this causes an, an uh, acceleration towards the surface. Um, and then when it hits the surface, it spreads out. And then this spreading out can also cause, uh, like I mentioned before, turbulence, wind shear, uh, quite hazardous conditions. We've, we've recorded wind gusts of over 100 knots in those uh, microbursts. Yeah, probably something that you don't want to be around or close to anyway in a light GA aircraft. So Harry's given us a bit of a look at things like thunderstorms, microbursts, and the, and the mechanics of the wet season. Now we have an opportune time to move on to Cameron. Cameron, as I said at the start of our presentation, um, is the head of operations of flight standards here in Darwin. Cameron's a pilot with significant top-end flying experience, both in fixed and rotary wing. 
Cameron, in your experience, putting yourself in the in the pilot's shoes, what are some of the, I suppose we could call them pressure points that might impact on young pilots, especially the inexperienced VFR pilot flying in the top end during the wet season? What are some of those pressure points that that the pilots need to be aware of and learn how to manage? Yeah, fair enough, Tim. Um, <clears throat> by pressure point, I'll... Look at it as sort of how the weather's going to interact with the um, the, the, the typical flight profile sure. of the flight. Because to be honest with you, a pilot, if it was just weather as the only thing in consideration, um, you're just not going to fly into it if it looks bad. Um, it's usually something else that interacts with it. So some of the sort of typical pressure points, if you like, yep. of a flight profile might be a departure phase. So a pilot contemplating a departure uh, needs to analyse the weather. Now, that creates significant hazard when an aircraft is you know, low in its uh, altitude and departing an aerodrome. It's particularly vulnerable to things like microbursts and thunderstorm activity and the like. Sure. Now, one of the tools that is available to pilots or is seen as being a tool is the concept of special VFR. Okay. Which has a little bit of a focus point here in the Northern Territory because it can be misconstrued as a uh, tool to actually be used for planning to facilitate departures from a controlled aerodrome. Now, we would generally, by way of talking about a pressure point, discourage that, uh, that concept to, to plan to use special VFR. It's just simply going to erode the margins that are um, in place regarding, um, regarding the protection from the weather. If I'm hearing you right, special VFR is something that pilots should not automatically flight plan and accept and uh, uh, expect to receive every single time. Absolutely. Air traffic control will not prioritise a special VFR flight, even though the term special may infer that. They will not prioritise a special VFR flight over the normal operations of an IFR flight. Now, if the weather's poor, you can expect a reasonably high density of IFR flights. So what's going to end up happening to the special VFR flight is they're going to find themselves potentially painted into a bit of a corner with limited options. Sure. Um, in weather conditions and separation from weather that's less than what's normally in place. Sure. And we must remember that the special VFR visibility minima can be down to 1,600 metres. And that's not a lot of visibility, especially when you're barrelling along at maybe two or two and a half miles a minute. Talking about avoiding weather, some of that bad weather that Harry was speaking about earlier, what are some of the things that pilots might be able to have in their toolkit to help them avoid weather? Maybe especially looking down the, the, uh, the idea of extra fuel, for example. Yeah, certainly. With time and fuel, um, most problems can be managed. And... We talk a lot about pilots not departing or not going flying when the weather's poor, but that's not really going to apply to a pilot who's already flying. Sure. So you're inbound to somewhere like Darwin, one of those remote sort of uh, capitals or towns, and it's being influenced by weather. So a good strategy is just to carry an amount of fuel that would enable you to um, wait out the weather whilst it passes through the aerodrome. Now, for IFR pilots, they have a very prescribed set of rules sure. that governs how much fuel they'll carry when weather conditions are below set uh, values. Same's true of VFR flight, but it's often not the focus of early pilot training, these, um, these uh, rule sets. So it's often sort of left to the pilots to figure it out for themselves because the usual sort of antidote to the VFR pilot is simply just don't go flying if the weather's bad. So the carriage of fuel is a really good mitigating strategy that a pilot can have up in this part of the world when the weather moves through. Thanks, Cameron. Just quickly, let's look at some of these other hazards. One of the bigger hazards that we face when flying around large thunderstorms where there's lots of cloud around is always that potential chance that the VFR pilot might find themselves in cloud. What are some of the things that a pilot could do if they find themselves a VFR pilot in cloud? What are some of the things that they can actually go through to try and, to try and work that situation out? Yeah, pretty serious um, situation if that occurs. So it's pretty important that the pilot gets it right. Yep. So the first thing I would suggest, and this is uh, very, very important, is that the pilot maintains their uh, wits. They keep their wits about them. 
um, the actions that they take from this point on are going to be pretty significant. Now, the best thing the pilot can do and the most important thing the pilot needs to do is to maintain control of the aircraft. In the absence of visual reference outside the aircraft, the pilot's going to have to rely on uh, his or her instruments. So having a good instrument scan is important and working to the instrument scan is very, very important. Sure. Okay. Um, And lastly, Cameron, um, before I flick back to Harry, is... One of the hazards that we have up here in the top end, um, not only during the wet season, but also during the dry season, is things like convective turbulence. Um, With regards to turbulence, Cameron, in your experience, what are some of the things that young VFR pilots need to be aware of with regards to the limitations of their aircraft and how to successfully negotiate turbulence? Okay, well, probably rule number one of turbulence would be to avoid it. Yep. Um, yeah, it's a common practice amongst IFR pilots is that they'll just fly around clouds. It's interesting, the aim of an instrument rating is to try and not fly in a cloud. And um, you'll often hear on the radio, IFR pilots will talk about deviations left and right of track. And the reason they're doing that is to avoid entering cloud, which will create turbulence. However, when we talk about aircraft limits and um, turbulence, there's probably two that are, uh, that are important. Firstly is your load factor limits on the aircraft. Yep. Now, by load factor, we're talking the amount of aerodynamic stress, I guess, in simple terms, that the airframe is designed to withstand. The typical normal category aircraft, which is um, consistent with the types that pilots will um, fly in charter operations and private operations, the load factor limits um, for a normal category aeroplane is uh, 3.8 G units um, in the positive sense and half that in the negative sense. Now in turbulence with the bumps and the um, stresses being put on the airframe, these can be exceeded. Now the aerodynamic loads on an airframe are going to be exaggerated or increased by the second limitation that probably comes into play here and that's the aircraft speed. Now manufacturers will publish a manoeuvring speed or a turbulence penetration speed which is the speed at which they counsel that the aircraft needs to be flown at or within i.e below in order to avoid the loads on the airframe becoming excessive Good information. Thanks very much, Cameron. Turbulence is one of those things that is, I suppose, a, a, a day-to-day hazard when flying around in, in the top end. And and uh, prolonged turbulence is, of course, you know, not very pleasant for not only the pilot, but especially the passengers in, in, in small aircraft. Talking about turbulence and all the other things that can be forecast about the place across here in this part of the country is, 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 our, is our forecasting, whether it be a graphical area forecast or a terminal area forecast. I just want to ask you, Harry, just quickly about forecasting. Uh, generically speaking, I suppose, how accurate are the Bureau of Met's forecasts uh, on, on a larger scale? Yeah, good question. I mean, I'd, I'd love to say we get it right 100% of the time. Of course you do. <laughs> but we don't. Sometimes we get it wrong. And and these this is this is to do with the forecast is our best guess. It's our 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 best it's a forecast. So it's us predicting the future basically. And there are a lot of steps in producing this forecast such as um, ingesting a massive amount of data, observations, uh, numerical weather prediction, um, and then using our scientific understanding of the broad scale atmosphere, and yep. then a lot of local effects. So like the sea breeze in Darwin, for example, those kind of things have huge implications on the development of thunderstorms and that kind of thing. So I can't give you an exact answer on you know 90% accurate or anything like that. But, yep. uh, what I will say is any time we put out a forecast, it's our best guess of that time. And if that best guess changes, so two hours later we say, hang on a minute, things have changed here. We've, yep. we've reassessed here. It's it's now this this is now the most likely situation. We'll amend the forecast as soon as we can to reflect that uh, that best guess of of what we think will happen. So, if I'm hearing you right, oftentimes weather up here in the top end can be can be quite chaotic. Um, and I think it was last night at our seminar in uh, in Darwin, Harry mentioned that. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but if the difference in the sea breeze might only be maybe two or three knots, that can mean 
seen the difference between not getting a thunderstorm and getting a thunderstorm. Yeah, absolutely. So like like you, you just mentioned, uh, in Darwin, sometimes the thunderstorms will come in from the southeast and they'll continue into Darwin and they might just hit the Berrimah traffic lights and start decaying because they hit that sea breeze coming in um, and then they can't get past that. So very, very small scale effects can, um, can have large implications on thunderstorms. And a good example of that too is uh, the Tiwi Islands, the regular thunderstorm we get there called Hector, uh, is due to that sea breeze interaction. So it's a small amount of land and all the sea breeze is converging and producing a regular thunderstorm there. And look, a question that I'll pose to both of you, and, and please feel free to jump in. We often get asked by pilots, yes, sure, thunderstorms can, can be hazardous, but if I have to go around a thunderstorm, how far do I have to go around? How close can I get to a thunderstorm? Um, Cameron, in your experience, how if you have to go around a thunderstorm, how close can you get? Well, I think that's a very contextual um, question. Different thunderstorms pose different different hazards and certainly of um, varying severities. Sure. You know, there's uh, quite minor um, cells that have caused lightning strikes significantly far, several miles uh, away from the, um, from the cell. Yet, um, in my own experience, you can sometimes pass quite close to a um, a cell with no adverse effect, but it's a little bit of a raffle. Yeah, thunderstorms are unpredictable. Weather's yep. unpredictable. The point in it is, is um, give them a wide berth. Um, we do have a few little golden rules um, regarding flying around thunderstorms. Firstly, uh, if you do have to pass a thunderstorm, fly around it. Fly around on the upwind side. Give it a good berth, but on the upwind side. Sure. To fly on the downwind side exposes you to potentially hail outside of the thunderstorm cell and other adverse effects. Okay. So if you have to fly downwind of a thunderstorm because you have no option to do otherwise, um, then you need to probably double, I guess, the amount of distance that you would have applied upwind on the downwind side. Okay. The other one too with that that I'll just bring out at this point is never try and fly under a thunderstorm to pass it. So around on the upwind side is preferable. Everything else is um, stepping away from that. So never flying underneath a thunderstorm. That's pretty good advice because then we get into the world of things like downdrafts and microbursts, which Harry was speaking about earlier. Now, is it true, gents, that you actually can suffer a lightning strike on your aircraft even though you are completely in clear air? Yeah, so, so lightning tries to find the path of least resistance to the ground. And, and I think last night we heard a story of uh, someone being struck by lightning. Was it 20 nautical miles from a thunderstorm, I think it yeah, was? So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend keep, keep as much distance as you can from them. But One of the other things, Harry, that, and I think we mentioned this last night, and I'd like to get it through to, to the people watching this evening, is... Is there a facility or if people have questions about the forecast, if they have difficulty with interpreting the forecast or if they have specific questions about anything uh, particular in the forecast, are they free to give um, the Bureau of Med a call even? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start off with, um, we've on our website we have uh, a knowledge centre and in, in that knowledge centre there's a vast array of knowledge on various topics, thunderstorms, wet season weather, uh, they, there's a lot of topics on that uh, weather phenomena. They yep. also go through um, a bit about our products as well. But um, we do list our phone numbers on the bottom of the graphical area forecast. So if you do have any questions about interpreting of the forecast, you're not quite sure about something sure give us a call and if you do see weather that is not forecast give us a call and let us know and have a chat about it because sometimes if, if we can't see the weather there sometimes we can struggle to forecast it as well so yeah look i can personally recommend that knowledge center on the bureau of mets website uh, it has all sorts of good information and certainly worthwhile digging into just a quick question for you cameron that's come through um someone was talking about the management of passengers as a pilot in command, especially in the wet season. Because in the wet season, with weather around and all sorts of things happening, you can often have not only just things like turbulence and bad weather, but flights can often get delayed. Are there any tips for that young commercial pilot coming up here to start their career 
on helping uh, to manage passengers and manage their expectations? Yeah, for sure. Um, the young commercial pilot um, coming up to the Northern Territory or the top end, generally speaking, one of the sort of skill sets that they are a little bit down in is the customer service aspect. Sure. And um, flying, particularly small aircraft charter, is actually very much a customer service um, activity. For sure, the technical flying of the aircraft is is important, but managing the customer in a situation like this is very important as well. You know, the benefits, you know, to the company, but you know, primarily to the safety of the flight's paramount. Now, generally speaking, um, the passengers will have some sort of imperative that they will need to get to a meeting or get to a task or similar. So, what a young commercial pilot would need to do. Um, in managing the passengers if the weather is inclement is just explain. I find the best way to do is just explain what the weather situation is, what the implications of that are, and what I propose to do about it. Generally speaking, if you can't provide a customer with what it is that they're wanting, um, then if you provide them a reason why that's the case and then a logical solution or alternative which may be wait out the weather, delay departure by an hour or two, or alternatively, I've seen in my experience that a company that I used to work for, we would explain to the passenger what the weather situation was and then um, offer to reschedule the flight for another day. And um, that was generally how it would, uh, would play out because... Most people and passengers, although ignorant of the technicalities of the weather, they only have to look into the sky in the Northern Territory and see the severity of the storms, and generally speaking, most people are pretty risk-averse in that sense. That's good information, Cameron, because part of the pilot's toolkit, especially up here in these challenging environments across the top end, is managing the expectations of passengers. Not only the discipline and the the behaviour of passengers, is just managing their expectations as well. Um, Just one more question I think that's just come through, Cameron, on my iPad here is more of an ATC-related question, especially perhaps for people flying around the the Cairns area or Broome or or Darwin or around the Tyndall area where we have air traffic control. What do I do if ATC gives me an instruction, Cameron, that I might find difficult to comply with or or I might not even be able to comply with it at all? Um, Because I think a lot of young commercial pilots, especially early on in their career, can on occasion be somewhat intimidated by ATC. So if you do get an instruction, what what can they do if they can't perhaps comply with it? Yeah, difficult mindset to break out of. Yeah. Uh, most pilots are generally accustomed to obeying the instructions that are provided by ATC. So they'll feel a big pressure to conform to the requirements that they're given. However, I guess in starting with this one, it's important to understand that there's certain things that air traffic control can't do for us. Right. They don't really have, particularly here in Darwin and the Northern Territory, from what we understand, they don't have a live weather feed. So they can't see the weather specifically. They okay. make their best guess based on the Bureau of Met um, website, much the same as we do. On so the they phone. rely on the good old Bureau of Met radar website like we do? Yep, with its delays and the likes like that. So what it comes down to is, is the person who has the best perspective on the weather situation for a particular flight is actually the pilot that's flying the aircraft. Okay. So having been given a uh, instruction that the pilot is not happy to comply with, the first thing, as he's got to remember at all times, is, is that the safety of the flight in the pilot in command's opinion has to be sustained. Always. So... In doing so, it's also important to interact with the air traffic controller and the term require as opposed to request is a bit of a trigger for them to um, basically understand that this is a little bit more important. Okay. So if you require a heading change or require a specific heading or require a change of level, then air traffic control will actually make their best effort to facilitate. Okay, but you might be asked to hold or there might be a short delay, but by and large, they're duty-bound to give you an alternative. Absolutely, but top tip on that one is is that the pilots certainly... It's a negotiation process. The pilots certainly can suggest what the alternative is or what they require. At the end of the day, you don't place the aircraft in harm's way regardless. But the earlier you can anticipate these requirements, 
the easier the negotiation process with air traffic control is going to be. Wonderful. Good advice. Good information from Cameron there and also from Harry. I suppose before we just wrap up tonight, one of the things that perhaps I'd like you to take home with you is the fact that we have fantastic weather forecasting, we have air traffic control, we have all these tools at our disposals, but even things like air traffic control and the Bureau of Met, and as Cameron spoke about earlier, with things like the limitations on our aircraft, we all have limitations that we have to operate within. That's essentially all we have time for this evening on our, on our live stream. I'd like to thank um, Harry from the Bureau of Met in Darwin. Thanks for coming along, Harry. Thanks a lot for having me. Much appreciated. And Cameron from Flight Standards in Darwin. Thank you, Cameron. Thanks, Tim. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and also your experience with us. Um, look, wherever you've been watching uh, this evening, I hope you found our live stream more than useful. Please keep an eye out for a, uh, a full wet season seminar, which we filmed last night in Darwin. We're going to put that on the CASA website and on our YouTube channel for you to, to have a look at at your leisure. Um, thank you to everyone that's made this possible and have joined us for, for um, this evening for your involvement and your questions. Wishing everyone a safe wet season and thank you very much for joining us tonight.